Welcome back to Primary Source China Investments. This week we're on show F6, and we're talking a little bit about China and Russian trade. Last week we covered Germany's trade with China and some of the reasons why that trade has already peaked. But trade, it seems, is like a balloon. You know, if you squeeze one side, the other side gets fat. And China's getting fatter as the EU retreats. Also, just a few days ago, the Biden administration issued additional sanctions on Russian businesses. That was in the aftermath of the Navalny death. And we're going to get into some of that. But first, let's start with China and Russia trade. Since the invasion of Ukraine two years ago, Chinese exports to Russia have grown by 120%. Today, China exports more to Russia than the entire EU. You can see right at the Russian invasion, everybody pulled back from trading with Russia. But since then, China has really accelerated its trade. So what is China selling to Russia? Well, that's the question that we're going to dive into a little bit here. To sustain the war effort, Russia needs supplies. They need rubber, chemicals, plastic. China has also become the largest supplier of machinery, but that's only part of the story. Nearly half of the goods China shipped to Russia in 2023 are consumer goods, not industrial goods. So just as Russian factories are now dependent on Chinese inputs, Russian households are increasingly dependent on Chinese-made apparel, toys, and even office equipment. They're also driving Chinese cars. Chinese vehicle exports are 900% higher in 2023 compared with the same time frame in 2019. We've also said last week that trading is not a monolith. You have to take a little bit deeper dive. And, you know, Hongo and I are not trade experts here. It's just what we're looking at, looking at the trend and looking at how things change. And there's plenty of headlines about Chinese exports to Russia, breaking records, but also the Russian exports to China. The volume of Russian crude oil shipped to China jumped 24% in 23 uh, to 107 million metric tons. That's 2 million barrels a day. Even new products such as the Arctic LNG-2, which was specifically sanctioned by the U.S., Chinese engineers stepped in and the project is ready to ship its first cargo to China. Even crab meat. China imported 400 metric tons of Russian crab meat, a 75 increase in a year. So, Penghua, we talk a lot about trade on the show. And the, the fact of the matter is you can't really stop trade. I mean, sanctions are doing something, but they're not doing everything. What's your thoughts? Yeah, that's it. I really want to uh, talk about it. Whatever uh, sections and the political view of whatever war, that's really like the short term. So think about the two big countries, they next to each other. Naturally, they should have the big trade. And also, this is uh, from the fundamental economy structure. They could uh, complement each other. So Russia provided the base uh, uh, upstream uh, like commodities, and the China uh, have a uh, strength in the manufactured products. So the problem is uh, before the war, is uh, Russia is really focused on the uh, euro side and a lot of the European product in there. So most uh, I think the people don't know like the China's product. They don't have the brand. They, they just don't know it from the market perspective. And after the war, uh, they really have no choice. So they just say, oops, oh, there are so many products over there, and then let's do it. And then right now in China, you will see there's a lot of advertisement on Russian black chocolate, uh, good milk, uh, and the sausage <laughs> is almost everywhere. And so this is, uh, as I would like to say, it's more like the natural way for these uh, two uh, countries to increase the uh, trade volume rather than uh, it, I think this should be like some kind of a normal situation rather mm. than uh, uh, old way or uh, surprised uh, to see the uh, trading volume. Yeah, this is sort of this last week when we talked about Germany, the symbiotic relationship at different points in the economic cycle and at different points in the country development, countries need different things. And Right now, China has stepped in where the EU has stepped back. That, that's very obvious. And the EU has stepped back, and some of those EU and U.S. companies have voluntarily stepped back. 
The, yeah, even for the like the energy trade, this is the, like the the largest part uh, uh, in the two countries. So uh, we know like the uh, historically Russian and that's a lot of negotiation with the Russian. They always worry about the China uh, get stronger and uh, uh, the pipeline and the routines is always get change and not start it. Uh, so that's uh, that's really. Uh, a significant delay these two countries uh, trade. So uh, and also there are a lot of the concerns uh, even with uh, like the Russian trade uh, to the Korea, Japan, some of the uh, countries. But right now uh, the the war forced them to put all the trade uh, flow into the uh, China. So you will see the volume get uh, increased. That's significant. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly the point. But, you know, as the war continues, so do the sanctions. I mean, just this week, three of the four largest Chinese banks announced that they're no longer accepting payments from sanctioned Russian uh, financial institutions. And on Friday, the U.S. Treasury Department targeted nearly 300 people and entities. State Department hit another 250. And the Commerce Department added 90 companies to the entry list. All of this is beginning to add up. And I do see China taking a little bit more cautionary tack. And then Friday sanctions from the US came in partnership with the EU and Britain. So all of these things are gonna to continue to add up. Now, the final point is, I don't know if these newest sanctions will have real long-term effects like you were talking about, but demand is global and balloons, have plenty of yeah, elastic. That's, that's really like the so I think most of people follow the rule, whatever uh, sections, right? And they make it, and most of the companies follow it. This is I keep saying. So, this is a political uh, uh, decision. So really, not a support uh, the market the trade, it's really added the barriers uh, to the market. And obviously, if they will cost the uh, for the most of the companies, they will cost a loss. And uh, uh, rather than added value. So, but the the key thing is that in the Russian, right? And we know if something uh, uh, failed, so you can blame the Putin and all the Putin related administration, whatever related. But in the Western country, since the two years of war, you will see a lot of stupid decision. And my observation is nobody really be responsible for that. Nobody really get a blame for that. And like the investment manager, okay, you make the money and you get the, uh, benefit and the carry, and you lose the money. That's not my fault. That's the market. Yeah, it's fault. Market. It's, oh, that's yeah, the market. It's, it's other, other people's responsibility. Is the other people maybe doing things too good? So uh, anyway, it, that's that that's that means there were more and more stupid political decision we make, and nobody uh, be responsible for that. The worst the punishment is just maybe change your job or change the uh, position. Uh, that's that's what I'm saying. So that caused a huge problem in, in the future. You will see a lot of the bigger consequence uh, uh, after those decisions. Yeah, and 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 for what we do every week, Hongguo, we just look at the at the results and try to figure out where things are moving. So with that, we're going to leave it with show F6. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.